Can Middlesbrough can match of the day has the highlights in half an hour. This is BBC One. Now the main evening news with Peter Sissons. Britain's new Minister for Europe meets negotiators from the European Union for the first time after Labour's landslide. Doug Henderson promises a fresh start with Europe not a threat but an opportunity. Tony Banks gets the call as Minister for Sport as Tony Blair continues to shape his government. And amphibious troops prepare to evacuate British citizens from the Zairean capital as the rebels close in. Britain today promised its European partners a fresh start following Tony Blair's landslide win in the general election. At the first talks at which the new government has been represented, the Minister for Europe, Doug Henderson, said Britain wanted to work with the European Union as a shared enterprise, not using the language of opponents, and he signalled that Labour would end Britain's opt-out from the social chapter. A likely contender for the Tory leadership, Stephen Dorrell, accused the government of already adding costs to British business and undermining the authority of Parliament. Our Europe correspondent James Robbins was with the new minister as he set off for Brussels this morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome on board this British Airways flight to Brussels. For Doug Henderson, day one as Minister for Europe meant a very steep learning curve. In flight, he was crammed by top Foreign Office officials on the mind-numbing detail of the negotiations on sovereignty, which he plunged straight into this afternoon. The new minister admitted to me it all looked daunting. Well, I think it's a fresh start. Um, putting the, some of the hostility, the unnecessary hostility between Britain and the other nations behind us, looking positive, looking at the things that are really in Britain's interests, and start negotiating in a tough way with other European partners. That talk of toughness was very deliberate to ensure other countries don't imagine life after the Tories means Britain's simply a pushover. In the negotiating chamber, other governments could hardly have been more welcoming, none more so than Germany's minister. Hello, Hi, it's Hoyer. Nice to meet you. Nice Congratulations to you. on nice this you. splendid Thank victory. You. Thank you very much. Hope you'll have a good couple <laughs> As soon as they sat down, Mr Henderson set out Britain's new stall. We'll work as colleagues in a shared enterprise now, he said promising Britain will sign the social chapter on workers' rights, but pledging not, for instance, to give up frontier controls, all echoing his boss's instructions from London. Signing up to the social chapter is in the interest of the people of Britain, and making sure we keep our external border controls is a very important national interest. If we focus on those areas where you must say no, we can actually make our voice heard. If we just shout all the time, as the Conservatives did, then eventually people ignore you. Mr Blair now has a unique opportunity uh, to chart a pragmatic but constructive course for the United Kingdom. Uh, no one wants a super state. Mr. Blair, therefore, doesn't need um, to shoot arrows against federalist conspirators lurking in Brussels corridors. Today, no one pressed the new minister too hard. At an international news conference, Mr. Henderson was open. He would need a bit more practice to learn other countries' negotiating tricks and the mysteries of a multilingual sound system. Je vous demande votre attitude. We can't <laughs> find the, um, the appropriate number. I think it's the number two, is it? So other member countries are delighted with day one of Labour in power in Europe. But they want to know much more about what lies behind the rhetoric and to what extent Britain's fresh start brings closer an agreement at the Amsterdam summit in six weeks' time on the most controversial issues of national sovereignty and power sharing. To try to find out, the Dutch Prime Minister, Wim Kok, flies to London on Friday for lunch with Tony Blair. James Robbins, BBC News, Brussels. The CBI has said there's nothing in the social chapter now that will add significantly to the costs of British industry, but that the government must live up to its promise to promote a flexible labour market. Trade unions had wanted Britain to sign up for the measure from the beginning. Our industry correspondent Stephen Evans. Left-wing activists were jubilant today on what they see as day four of the new labour era. At belated May Day celebrations, expectations were high, fuelled when they heard Labour would move swiftly to have the social chapter in Britain. 
So far, two directives have been issued. Compulsory works councils to inform employees in big international firms. And fathers as well as mothers must get time off on the birth of a child. But more rules on rights for part-timers and sex discrimination are on the way. Employers fear more will follow. Well, signing up the social chapter won't have an immediate big impact because there isn't much in it. But once you establish that authority at European level, it could be the mechanism which introduces mistaken policies in the future. And therefore it's vitally important that the government, once it has signed up, really lives up to a commitment which Tony Blair made in the campaign to uh, campaign for uh, flexible labour markets in Europe and change attitudes in Europe. In Jersey, delegates gathered tonight at the first union conference under Labour. They discounted employers' fears. We believe that on the continent, where the social legislation has been around for a long time, that it's not been disadvantageous to employers, and they still sell abroad, they still export. We believe it's in the best interest of British workers that they have at least equality with uh, the continental workers. Despite the optimism at union conferences like this one, lawyers say it's not simply a matter of signing up for the social chapter. Existing treaties and protocols have to be undone and then put back together with Britain involved. Lawyers think the social chapter won't apply in Britain until at least 1999. Stephen Evans, BBC News, Jersey. The maverick Labour MP Tony Banks has been made sports minister in Tony Blair's new government. It's the most surprising of dozens of appointments made today in the middle and junior ministerial ranks. So far, 19 women have been given posts in the government, the highest number ever. Two new members of the Treasury team emerged to pose for the cameras this morning. Dawn Primarolo is Financial Secretary to the Treasury, the post she shadowed in opposition. Helen Liddell is Economic Secretary in a government with more women in its ranks than this country has ever seen. As the Blair family moved into Downing Street, the new Prime Minister was putting into place the team that will be expected to adapt quickly to the transition from opposition to government. Today's appointments include Ian McCartney, a former shadow spokesman on health and employment, who is Minister of State at Trade and Industry. Tessa Jowell moves into the post she shadowed as Health Minister. Stephen Byers is Minister of State at Education, with special responsibility for school standards. Brian Wilson, a key figure in the campaign, gets a ministerial post at the Scottish office. Alan Howarth, who defected from the Conservatives two years ago, is to be a junior education minister, the post he held for three years under the Tories. And the former actress Glenda Jackson is now a junior environment and transport minister. The one big surprise so far is the new sports minister, Tony Banks, an outspoken left winger who said he was absolutely gobsmacked when he got the call from Downing Street. A well-known Chelsea supporter and fervent animal rights campaigner, he was once described as the left's most effective comedian but colleagues say he's been appointed on merit. Tony Banks is a Chelsea supporter, so that uh, may be one reason not to have appointed him as Minister for Support. But I think it will be one which is welcome, because people know that Tony Banks has a love, has a commitment for sport. Mr Banks may find it hard to toe the government line on occasions, but it's a position where his many talents just might shine through. Carol Walker, BBC News, Westminster. There have been fresh moves tonight in the race for the Conservative leadership. Joining me now from Westminster is our chief political correspondent, John Sargent. John, what can you tell us? Well, in the Times tomorrow, John Redwood is going to announce that he will run for leadership of the party. No surprise, I suppose, in that, but his headline in the paper is, I can't defend the past, I can unite the party. The former Welsh Secretary, William Hague, is, I understand, deciding tonight whether he should stand. He's only 36 and there are some of his supporters who are saying perhaps he will decide to wait, to sit this one out and wait perhaps for five more years before considering the leadership. The other people who are expected to announce, perhaps as early as tomorrow, are Stephen Dorrell and also we expect Michael Howard fairly soon to come in on a race which already includes Kenneth Clark and Peter Lilly. So it looks like a six-horse race. As the Tories grapple with the problems of opposition, how is Labour coping with the equally unaccustomed problems of government? Well, I think they're finding it quite hard. I was speaking to one minister tonight, and he said, it is difficult. You get straight into the work, and the civil servants are there, all ready to help, of course, but they want decisions very quickly. They wanted decisions today on whether the department should bid for a bill in the Queen's speech. And there was a yes minister moment for one of the ministers when the civil servant looked at their manifesto and then looked at the minister and said, Minister, I'm afraid I don't quite understand this bit. 
So there's been hard work but excitement as the ministers grapple with their new problems. And what are the priorities in the coming week? Well, on Wednesday, they all turn up at Westminster and Tony Blair gives a speech to the Parliamentary Labour Party. On Thursday, there's the first cabinet where the Queen's speech will be decided and the Irish Prime Minister John Bruton is coming. And then on Friday, the Dutch Prime Minister Wim Kok is coming. Now, both these Prime Ministers, the Irish Prime Minister and the Dutch Prime Minister, asked to see Mr Blair and so he's given them time for it, but it's not expected to be, as it were, a full-scale summit. More a get-to-know-you session for both those Prime Ministers. John Sargent, thank you. The leader of the rebel forces